Magandang Addo. It's so good to finally have an opportunity to touch bases with my brothers and sisters in the Philippines. Uh, it was such a blessing. I was there in 2004, myself and I was a part of a team and we were, we were treated royally. Uh, we were welcomed and they just loved on us. And it was a, a great joy to spend time, I believe with um, Burke Camacho and his wife and the Hope Church. It was a real blessing when I got home, I was excited to tell my wife and family about my experiences in the Philippines. And so Robert Boyd and myself spent quite a bit of time together and, and uh, one lady approached us at the mall and she was talking to us and she said something to me. And then I said, well, what about him? And she said, oh, he Filipino. <laughs> so <laughs> she thought Robert was from there, but uh, actually we brought Robert over there with us and he came back and I'm sure his wife was glad that he came back. You know, during this time, we, we, we live in perilous times and, and all of us have gone through something or another. And there's nobody that's not had a loss in their family, I don't think. I think everybody's experienced loss of close friends, family members. And we have to keep in mind so that we don't get discouraged is that that's God's business. We don't control the expiration date on his creation. There's a time to be born and there is a time to die. And so God sets the, the perimeters between beginning and the ending. And so the scripture points it out this way it says about God, it says, not only is he the beginning, he was before the beginning. This is all a part of his plan, his creation the marvelous works of his hands. And so we thank and praise God for it. And if you want to take the opportunity right now, Palak Pakan Naito, Sai Jesus Christ. Yes, I'll join you in clapping and applauding Jesus. He's wonderful, amen. He's glorious and he deserves all praise and all honor. And so I, again, I'm, I'm thankful to have an opportunity to just make contact with you. I'm looking forward to making another trip there. All of my children are grown now, it's been some years. And so I don't have to worry about getting back to them. So uh, if you will, this is an opportunity for me to, this, to, to just share my heart. And so the subject I'll be talking about during this time is fleshing out the word, fleshing out the word. It might seem to be something a little out of the ordinary when you talk about fleshing. I know most people's mind go straight to all of the negative connotations of what the word says about fleshing or being in the flesh. And so it becomes difficult for you to process it, but trust me, by the end of this, I think we'll all be encouraged and we we'll all benefit from what God has to say in his word. So let me pray and then we're gonna get started. Father, we thank you and praise you for my sisters and brothers in the Philippines. I thank you for Cross Culture Church. I thank you for Pastor Walker and the elders and everybody that works in the ministry and even the parishioners and for everybody at Hope Church. We pray, Lord, that you set things in order and that you cause things to be well there. Your body is a living organism all over the world. We are local fellowship, but we are part of the body of Christ. And we thank you and praise you for causing us to be a part of the body. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I just had a fun memory, you know, that. The, the kids who are probably grown now and maybe have families of their own, they were 
every time I got near basketball, they say, well, slam the ball, slam the ball in the goal. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, my weight prohibited me from slamming the ball in the goal. But uh, let's move on. I don't want to talk about that much longer. <laughs> okay, fleshing out the word. When you think of fleshing out the word, the first thing that comes to mind is to say, well, fleshing sounds like an action word. So what exactly does it mean? Well, I took the time to look up the word flesh so that we could take a glimpse in what was um, secular or uh, the, uh, the definitions that are provided on um, the dictionaries that are presented on, online, the Webster's Dictionary online. And so uh, the first definition says a soft part of the body of an animal, especially of a vertebrate, especially the part composed chiefly of skeletal muscles as distinguished from internal organs, bones, um, and integument. Uh, the edible part of an animal, flesh of a mammal or fowl eaten as food. The physical nature of human beings, and I thought this was strange that Webster decided to say this. He said, the physical nature of human beings, that's your flesh. And then he says, in conjunction with that, the spirit is indeed willing but the flesh is weak. And he cites Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. So we're gonna go along that line eventually, but now I just wanna just focus on the secular meaning. It also means human nature and human beings, humankind, living beings. And as a last portion of that definition, a stock or kindred. Now, I also looked up flesh in the Vines Expository Dictionary. And Vines is a Christian tool that, that, that some, some of us might use. It's available online, uh, free of use, uh, for free use. And uh, you can look up uh, and trace words back to their, their origin, whether they were written in Hebrew or Greek, but we're probably not gonna mention anything about Hebrew or Greek except to say that, you know, the Hebrew primarily the Old Testament, Greek, the New Testament. Okay, so Vine says it this way. It says, the substance of the body, where the beast of man, and it cites a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 39. And then it goes on to say a human body. And when you look at it a little further, I, I selected certain ones, but you can refer to your notes and you'll see all of the things that I've had outlined there for you. In James, well, in Matthew 26 and 41, we saw what it says, it's the weaker element of human nature. I also decided to use that definition based on vines. And it was mentioned by uh, the Webster Dictionary online says the weaker part, weaker element in human nature. Then he goes on to say that it's the unregenerate state of man, the state of man who does not know God. That's what the flesh represents and the flesh is according to the Bible. And then it says the seat of sin in man, that's the flesh. And, and in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18, it refers to it that way. So the lower temporary element in a Christian, natural attainments of men. And then it says as uh, the outward and seeing as contrast by the spirit, the inward and real. So, He's saying that 
Your flesh is what's seen. It's the outer shell. It's the body. It's the part that's seen. The inward part is invisible for now. And it's inward. And the reference with vines, he says that it's even more real than the visible part. And then he goes on to say also the natural relationship. And then flesh is contrast with the spirit in Romans chapter two, verse 28, and Romans 29, uh, 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 chapter two, verse 29. Now, I'm gonna give you a lot of scriptures just to start with, but they're in your notes. And then he goes on to describe the flesh as it relates to the heart and the spirit. Now we've talked about uh, the, the three components of man already, but we'll talk a little bit uh, more shortly. So he says, it's also Romans 7, 25 with the mind, the flesh correlates with the mind and is coupled with the mind in Ephesians two and three. So we see all those examples that are written um, as it relates to the flesh in the Bible. And this is the one that stood out to me because I wanted to point out some things. It says, the flesh is associated with or pertaining to the carnal. And then the next line says the carnal nature of the flesh, sensual. Uh, and so those are some things that I'll point out shortly, but I wanted to mention that as a part of the definition for the flesh. Generally, when you say somebody's acting in the flesh, it's, it's generally associated with negative connotations. It's generally associated with some doing the wrong things. You, you just too, you too fleshy. But this definition of fleshing is something that I wanna expound upon so we can see it and see how it fits with everything. Now, when you talk about the mind and flesh, speaking broadly, the carnal, the carnal nature denotes the sinful element in man's nature by reason of descent from Adam. He's saying, so we in our DNA, we inherited something from Adam. When Adam sinned, we got the sin nature from Adam. And so we're prone to do the wrong thing as well. And a lot of people use that as excuse. Oh, well, it's just natural. Well, naturality is something that God has said that we shouldn't yield entirely to. Because when you yield to those sentiments inside yourself, it's prone to take you down a way that you don't need to go. And it's prone to do harm to you. And so what he says is that there are some remedies to, to, uh, to submitting to your carnal nature or to your fleshly nature. And so we're still talking about fleshing, fleshing out. One of the meanings uh, in the Webster Dictionary, the unabridged portion, is it talks about fleshed out, fleshed out, uh, fleshing out, flashes out. All of these are associated with this fleshing. And then when you look at the phrase flesh out, it means to provide more information about something to make something more complete by adding details. Here's a good example. You need to flesh out your plan with more details. I would understand your plan if I could see more about what your intentions were in making the plans in the first place. So when we look at this word fleshing out, we're still looking at this action word, but it parallels completely with another word. And before we get there, let me mention this. Uh, I saw one portion of the definition says a, a fleshing tool. And so that tool reminded me of something that happened early on in the Bible in, um, in chapter three. It says a fleshing tool is a blunt concave uh, knife or a flexible wire tool used to flesh a skin or a hide. When they say flesh a skin or a hide, that means to cut the, the skin 
or the hide away from the other portion of the fleshy body of an, uh, of an animal. And I know a little something about that because I've, um, I, I'm a hunter. And so I spent a lot of time in the woods and uh, I, I flushed the hides of deer and rabbit and pigs. And so I understood what he was talking about. But in my mind, it goes directly to something that happened with Adam and Eve. You talk about the carnal nature or the, or the adamic nature that came as a result of the sin of Adam. And so when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they decided that they were going to cover up their sins. And so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves because they realized now I see parts of you that I've never seen before. And I understand some things about you that I never understood before after they sinned and did what God said not to do. So God, in all his divine wisdom, said, the, there's no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. So he took some animals, shed their blood, and made them some clothing. So they put the clothing on. So there's no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And so I thought directly about Colossians um, chapter three, verse five through 10 talks about the cutting away of the carnal nature. And I told you oftentimes when you say somebody's fleshly or they're fleshed out, you're talking about negative connotation, but it goes both ways. And so he, here it is. If you move, it happens only after God sanctions it or authorizes it. See, it wasn't until God breathed into Adam after he formed him from the dust of the ground that Adam became animated and he became a living soul. And so when he became a living soul, he was able to do something that he had not been able to do or to even have a, a knowledge of being able to do before God breathed into him, he became alive and he became animated. So it happens this way. If you move, it happens after God sanctions it and authorizes it. An outside force moves you along or you walk, run, crawl, or fall. As a result of being animated, God gives us the freedom to be able to move around and to do some things that we need to do in life and that he in fact empowers us and gives us that grace to be able to move around but he doesn't want us to go against the things that he's prescribed and written in his word so it says in genesis chapter one verse one in the beginning god i could stop right there and just spend the rest of my hour but that's you know we're, we're going to touch that and talk about the reference to fleshing out since he created us it says he was from the beginning in the beginning god he was from the beginning and he is the beginning so in other words he was before the beginning in terms of what we understand we live in this realm of natural and god lives both the spiritual and the natural and so since we live there, we have to understand what God, that, that we didn't come before God, we came way after God. And so in first, I mean, in John chapter one, verse one through 14, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word, and he was in the beginning with God, the word was. So now you see the word, and God, and all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made. And he goes on and says also in, in Revelations chapter one, verse eight, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the almighty. And so, he says that as a point of reference for us, for us to understand. He's not just the author, he's the authority. 
And he's not just the finisher of our faith, but he's the perfecter of our faith. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, you need this faith. This, this, this flesh, fleshing out is directly related to walking out this life. But in order for you to be able to do it the way that God desires for you to do it, it must be a faith walk. And so it's not just to believe for something or this or that. It's for life and existence, our way of life. Jude says in one uh, chapter one, verse three, beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once delivered to you, delivered to the saints. Now, when he tells you to contend earnestly, he's talking about you need to fight. You need to fight for the faith that resides inside of you and not just let your natural desires overwhelm your body and do everything that it can think of to do. You got a natural response and you got a spiritual re response. It's necessary for us to, to go with God who is spirit. And so we fight and defend and protect the faith. I, this is it, he says it this way. Keep your hearts with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. When I think of that passage of scripture in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, I immediately think about, and out of your bellies will flow rivers of living waters. That's why he says to guard your heart, because what you expose yourself to, what you see with the ear gate, I mean with the eye gate and the ear gate, it will influence you. If, if you don't have a proper basis for anything, it's hard to unsee the wrong thing or unhear the wrong kinds of things. Words and images, they must be dealt with like the word says to do. It says it this way, casting down every high thing. Well, let me just read it. Cast down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And so when we don't do that, we respond like what we've been exposed to. If I take the time to be around people who say all of the most negative things and, and don't say anything about God, then eventually I will either be the influence or I will be influenced by them. And that's just the way our nature is. If we don't take the, the opportunity to speak out and to speak up, then we'll follow whatever environment we're in, basically, when we walk naturally. Okay, so we're still talking about fleshing out the word. And I'm trying to get to the place where I can describe exactly what this is. Now, I said a moment ago that fleshing out the word can be parallel with walking. Both are action words. There's a bad fleshing out and a good fleshing out, a natural fleshing out and a spiritual fleshing out. And so I hope you'll be able to see the connotations in each uh, as we move on with this lesson. So you see, what, what you do will be fleshed out naturally or spiritually. It goes either way. Let's talk about the bad or the natural and the natural bad. We're born with a fleshless substance, therefore, what we do is fleshly, naturally. It's flesh and it's fleshed out naturally. Our sin nature, we inherit it from Adam during the fall in the garden. And it talks about it in chapter three in Genesis. But I, what I wanna focus in on are the other elements of fleshing out before we get to the part that really describes what God intended and what the meaning of this word, fleshing out the word. Works of the flesh is described in scripture as follows. In Ephesians chapter two, verse one through three, it says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince or the power of the air, the spirit who now works 
in the sons of disobedience, uh, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. And so you see this example of how our, our natural ability, uh, what, what we do naturally as a result of the DNA we inherited from Adam and the fall in the garden. A lot of things didn't exist before there was a fall in the garden. God gave Adam and Eve or gave Adam instructions. And over time, over time, they went away from what God has said. He communicated the very same things that God had said to him. There were two trees in the middle of the garden. He said, listen, you can eat. You cannot eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. There were two there, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge and good and evil. But eventually, Eve took fruit from the tree and ate it and then gave to her husband who was with her. She was not alone in this, but Adam was with her and he was complicit. And so since God gave him the instruction, he was the one that was held more accountable. And as a result of the sin, there were certain things put in place for the woman. There were certain things put in place for Adam and also for Satan, who was present and, and um, spearheaded this uh, fall in the garden. And so now we see that we got that fleshly nature. And I just read to you in Ephesians chapter two, what it says, all of us were that way. We got the, the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Now, in Galatians chapter five, verse 19 through 21, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in past time, that those who practice such things would not inherit the kingdom of God. And so that's what I was, those are some of the things I was alluding to earlier, that if we practice the works of the flesh, fulfilling the natural desires, it'll take us further and further away from God. But here's the thing you have to remember, God will not put requirements on you that he's not gonna assist you and give you an, a, a divine grace ability to do. There is no way he's going to hold you accountable for something that you were unable to do, but that he graces us so that we can walk this walk. And so we're going to talk about a little bit more after this. Okay. Therefore, this is what he says. Put to death your members, which are our own earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passions, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of the mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man and his deeds and you have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And so what he's talking about, he's talking about the, 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 the Adamic nature, the nature that we got from Adam. And then he says, when, when God changes you, when you become, you move from being unregenerate to regenerate, where God changes you, he converts you, then he says that Christ helps us. He renewed us in the knowledge according to the image of him who created us in the image of God. Okay, and 
uh, the last one of these I want to read uh, about works of the flesh is, let's see, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 16. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. That's what I was saying. He, he wouldn't hold you responsible for something that he's not going to give you an ability or, or help you to live out. So from that temptation and reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed, and they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. God has an order for everything. Whereas angels who are greater in power and might and do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. So he says, if the angels are not willing to, 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 to accuse, then you should take an example from them who have more power than us and they're spiritual, but not flesh. And no way, again, God would not require us to live a certain way if it were not possible. But all of heaven helps us to live out the things that God requires for us. Oh, I better add this too. And because a lot of people get caught up on this element and it says, but these, the natural brute beasts uh, made to be caught and destroyed, seek evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have hearts trained on covetous practices and are accused or cursed children, rather. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved wages of unrighteousness, but he rebuked, he was rebuked for his inequity, and a dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice rest, restrained the madness of the prophet. So we see the spirit of Balaam. When men are money hungry and money thirsty, and they go in their way uh, seeking, uh, seeking financial resources that way, util trying to utilize the gospel, it's the spirit of Balaam, a spirit of unrighteousness, where they seek out money and they do whatever they do for money. And it's not something that God wants us to be a part of. But now we see that. In Titus, he reminds us, he says, to be subject to the rulers and authority, to obey and to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in the malice and envy, hating and hating one another. It's important for us to understand where we came from. And now that we're able to walk in a certain way with God, and it's not by any ability of our own, but it's by the grace and plan of God that we're able to walk out this walk with God and to follow his plans and to follow his dictate. Peter said this, he said, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. So in the times of refreshing, when they come from the presence of the Lord, so when you talk about repentance, you're talking about turning away from sin, walking in the opposite direction from the sin that you're encountering, going away from it, not going to it. But when you talk about conversion, repentance, turn away. Conversion, you turn away, but you turn to Christ and you allow him to fill your very being and to change your nature from that which is debased to something 
that is high and spiritual. So now that's what I'm saying. God does not hold us responsible for something that we don't have an ability to do. Can we live out this life that he requires of being perfect before him? Perfect has to do with being mature. Yes, we can live out this life. He enables us. He graces us. He helps us. And the angels helps us, help us. Now, I told you that there was a, a fleshly way that we walk, and I just gave you several examples of it, and you can see others in your notes. But I'd like to talk now about how we should walk when we know God, how we should walk when we know God. That's fleshing out the word. Remember, I told you there was a secular way and there was a natural way and fleshly works are talked about all through scripture. And so what I want to talk about now is not the fleshly works, but this is a spiritual walk. And this is a walk uh, with the Lord. And he helps us from all of our infirmity, whatever ails us, he helps us. Uh, the psalmist said it this way, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I don't have to want for anything. I don't have to have a desire that goes away from him, but my desire is to him to go and to move in that direction. So um, if you will, Ephesians chapter five, verses one through eight, it, it really just outlines some ways that we should walk and it makes them fairly clear to me. And so let's go without further ado. Here's how we should walk. There are three ways. In Ephesians chapter one, it says, therefore be imitators of God as dear children. Follow God. Be a follower of God. Imitate God. How does God respond when there's adversity? How does God respond? It hurts to lose someone, but how does God respond? He has to deal with it on a level that's beyond anything we could think of. Every day, your creation is dying and leaving the earth. But I told you God has a plan and we shouldn't get caught up on the fact that we are, are experiencing losses because of this COVID. God, it has a time frame and a time limit, just like anything else. God set the boundaries for waters so that they wouldn't overflow the banks. And so, and since he did this, we know that he can control this thing of COVID. Sometimes we need to stand up in the power that God has given. In Ephesians chapter five, verse one, they say, therefore be imitators of, dear, of God as dear children. And this is one of the ways he says to walk. And walk in love. When you think about love, there are many connotations of love. There's friendship love, there's godly kind of love, and then there's the arrows that that's the love between a husband and a wife. They get a, a different way to express that. And so all of these are connotations of love. He says to walk in love. But the true essence of what he was saying, walk in love, he was talking about who's love? God is love. Walk in love. Walk in the nature of Christ. As Christ also has loved us, and giving himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma, you walk this way. And then he goes and admonishes us, but don't be involved with fornication and all uncleanliness and covetousness. Let it not even be a named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, nor just uh, uh, which which are not fitting for the very nature of Christ, but rather giving thanks. And there's another place in scripture talking about giving thanks for all things. Always give thanks because it's the will of God concerning you. For this, you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idol idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. 
because of these things and the wrath of God that come upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. But then this is the next form he tells you to walk. So you have walk in love. And then he says, walk in the light. Well, everything points right back to God. Who's the light? Jesus is the light. It said it in first, I mean, it said it in John chapter one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, the word was God. And then it talks about he was the light of men, but men did not comprehend his light. When you talk about light, it's funny he said they didn't comprehend his light or understand his light. When you talk about light, you have to mention illumination, understanding. He says it this way, and I'm going to talk about this in just a minute, uh, in, in Proverbs. He said, wisdom is the principal thing. But in all you're getting, get an understanding. Walk in the light. And this is what he said. For you were once in darkness, but now you're in the light of the Lord. Walk as children of light. And then he outlines the fruit of the spirit. For the fruit of the spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with un fruitful works of darkness. Don't be in the dark. Don't go at a place where you turn your mind off and is willing to accept whatever somebody tells you because that's not going to be right. But he says, walk in the light. Walk in the place of illumination. Walk in the place of enlightenment. Walk in the place to be able to shine forth. If you're illuminated, you're ready to be set on a hill so that you're not to be hid and you can speak forth the gospel. And so you also give off light. Now, this is the third way that he says to walk. There are three ways for us to walk. Walk in love, walk in the light, and then he says to walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom. And this is how he says it. See that you walk circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Remember, I said we live in perilous times. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, which in is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. There's another place in scripture where it talks about what he's talking about right here walk in wisdom, he's talking about walking in the influence of God. When you say, when you're full of wine, you're under the influence. When you're full of God or you're full of the spirit, you're under the influence of the spirit. If you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so that's what he's talking about, walking in wisdom. Wisdom is an integral part of God. It's an integral part of his makeup. It says that by wisdom, he formed the earth and created all of the things that exist. And so it's imperative and it's important for us to understand. He's talking about walking in wisdom, walking in influence, walking in understanding, walking in the knowledge of God that you have. That's why it's so imperative for you to read your Bible. Most Christians don't want enough of God to read their Bibles every day. You need to read your Bibles every day because that's where you're full of the spirit. You spend time. Who you spend time with is who you'll be like. If you're living out there among the world all the time and that's all you hang around with and you never go to the church or you're never around Christians to, 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 to be stirred up and to be encouraged, then you're going to take on the attributes of the world. That's what I was saying. Who you spend time with is who you be like. If you spend time in God's presence, reading his word and praying and practicing his presence, then you take on his character and his character lives through you and you become a living epistle. A long time before you say anything to anybody, they look at you and say, you're different. You're not like everybody else I, I know. You don't say bad words, but you control your mouth. And you don't, you don't misrepresent God like I see some people doing. 
And so that's what God wants of us so that we are proper representatives of him. And it says in Ephesians chapter two, verse one through seven, excuse me. And you, he made a lie. This is what happened when you went from being unregenerate to regenerate, when, you, when God renewed your life, when you were born again. He said, and he made you alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, like Adam, in which you once walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, hallelujah, because of his great love and with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ while we were yet sinners. And then he said, uh, by grace you have been saved and raised up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places inside Christ Jesus, his existence. We reside inside his existence. When we stand, we don't stand alone. We stand with Christ standing in us and the representative of everything that he is and he did on Calvary's cross. The blood, when God sees us, he sees us through this sacrifice of Jesus, the blood washed person. He healed the sin sick soul. And so it's important for us to understand that. And so how do we avoid walking in our carnality or walking in our flesh? We walk in the spirit. Galatians chapter five, verse 16 and 17. It says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Remember I said uh, before, he's talking about walking in wisdom. And then he said, don't be drunk with wine. Don't be under the influences of wine, but be filled with the spirit. If you're full of wine, you're under the influences of wine. If you're full of the spirit, you're under the influences of the spirit and the spirit shall lead you and you shall be born alone to walk in a way that pleases God because you're following his dictates from the spirit that lives inside of us. Okay, so he says, walk in the spirit. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the lust, for the flesh lust is against the spirit. It diametrically opposed. The lust of the flesh, your natural desires go against what your spiritual desires are and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things you wish, but you're led by the spirit and you're not under the law. And then verse 25 says it this way. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. For if we walk in the spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so there are three ways to walk. You walk in love, you flesh out the word in love. If I could interchange that word for fleshed out or fleshing, you, you, you flesh it, you're fleshing out the word in love. You're fleshing out the, the word in the light of Jesus Christ, in the light that illumines our way and enlightens us and causes us to shine forth as a result of the light being in us. And then he says, we flesh out the word in wisdom. How am I on my time? Okay. And so God desires for us to serve his purpose, purpose in this generation. Whatever generation we're in, he desires for us to serve his purpose. And we should go for God with everything within us. That's why he said, love the Lord with all your heart your mind, your soul, and your spirit. When you think about these components of your being, your soul and your spirit resides on the inside of you. And your mind and your body 
all of those are part of you. Part you don't see, part you can see. And so here's the thing. When God created us, he gave us, gave us this nature. But it wasn't a corrupt nature until Adam violated what God said in the Garden of Eden. Now, when you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, it says this. This is the history. This is his story of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Jesus said, you see me, you see the Father. And John said, that's what's said in John chapter 14, verse 9. Um, and they are always together, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are made in his image after his likeness, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Spirit, soul, body. That's where we are, spirit, soul, body. and so. God desires for you to use every part of your being to glorify him. We have passion, but we have to regulate that passion. We have desires, but we have to regulate those desires. Everything should go by way of the cross, the word of God. And so it creates in us the right imagery that wasn't contorted or bent out of shape as a result of Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden. There are three, the one, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are made in the image of God. It says in the beginning, God, Elohim. And when you mention this word, it's talking about God in his plurality. God in everything that he is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He said, let us make man in our image after the tripartite being that we are, we created that same imagery in man. Tripartite, spirit, soul, body. So when God breathed the breath of life into man, he became a living soul. And this likeness was his image. The dust, the formulation of the dust into a shape by God, it became a body and they became animated when God breathed into man, breathed into this uh, dust which he had formed. It became animated and alive, became a living being. The spirit and soul came together. The body was there when God formed the dust of the earth and formed man in his image. The, the, the spirit and soul came together when he breathed into man. Man became a living being and he became animated. And we the same way, we became spirit, soul, and body. And so he gave us dominion in order for us to be able to walk this life out. When we truly walk in our dominion, we can tell Satan, we can, we can stop him at the scene of all of the infractions that he created in our lives. But we do this by way of what Jesus did on the cross. That power and that authority that was abdicated after Adam and Eve's sin, it was taken away because Adam and Eve sinned, God brought it right back to us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It puts us in a right setting. So now we have authority again to, to have dominion the way that God decided to give us dominance in the earth realm. And so we walk that way and we live out our lives to be pleasing before God. And so God is the creator of heaven and earth. And he created us and we are created in his image. And he desires for us to walk in a way that's pleasing to him. Walk in love, walk in the light and walk in wisdom. And you can't go wrong when you understand what each of these mean.
Palak Pakan Nacho Sai Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful to be able to share with you and to have a time to just come before you and share some things that I thank God put on my heart. If you take them to heart, they'll become a part of you and you can grow in them. As you receive the word, as you spend time in God's presence, those are places where you feel fresh. You feel fresh. And when you feel fresh, you walk in the spirit, that means you're full of the spirit. You're under the influence of the spirit when you're full of the spirit. The same way, if you're under the influence of wine, it's because you're full of wine. But if you walk while you're full of the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, but you'll satisfy the requirements and the dictates that God has placed on us. And he's not a, a God that would tease us about anything and the desires in our hearts, but he, he wants us to govern those desires and to use synergy to direct the desires in our life, the passions in our life, to satisfy the kingdom of God and his purpose for us. Praise God and amen.